Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, we do praise you and thank you. We thank you, Father, that you love us. We thank you that you sent your son to die for us. And he's not dead. He's alive, risen in glorious resurrection, that, that he's coming soon for us. And that you love us so much that you wrote the greatest love letter that any husband can write to his bride. So, Lord, open our hearts to receive. Even when it's not necessarily pleasant, Lord, we, we, we invite you to show us those dark areas of our hearts that we might give them to you. Father, I pray for the Harvest America this night, that your Holy Spirit would even now be moving, that many would come to know Yeshua, that not, they wouldn't have a, a knowledge of him, but they would receive him and they would walk with him. So bless, Lord. Pour out your spirit upon us this morning. And we thank you for what you're going to do now because we ask it in Jesus' name and for his sake. And if you agree with that, you will say amen. amen. You know, to make something or build something, sometimes it seems like it's a big deal, but that's actually the easiest part, to, to, to build something. It's kind of like marriage. It's easy to say, I do. It's everything that comes afterward that's hard. Amen? Because look, at it. it's easy to build something, but to grow and maintain something, that truly takes insight and hard work. It's what we call the infrastructure of everything around us. You know that underneath the roads, you can lay down a road, but underneath there's things that if you don't keep your eye on, well, the trusses and the bridges and all these things, they can just begin to corrode and collapse. And it's a picture of the spiritual life. See, when it comes to the church, Jesus said this, Matthew 16, 18, I will build my church and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. See, Jesus didn't say he was going to build his church on Peter or any man. He said he would build his church on the gospel. That's the foundation. His shed blood, his sacrificial death, his glorious resurrection. That's what he's building his church on. That's the foundation. But listen, that foundation must be maintained. Otherwise, the church, a believer, is going to begin to corrode. Because like I said, it's just like when you have batteries. Poison begins to seep in. And if you're not watching out, if, if you're not watching out, listen, all that is good will erode and become corrupt and will collapse. And that's exactly what we see as we look at the church of Thyatira. See, this is the middle le letter. It's the middle child of the seven letters. And if you're a middle child, I didn't say that to offend anybody. But you know how it is if you're the middle child. You feel left out. Well, this church is going to make sure it's not being left out. It's the longest of the seven letters. And it's written to the smallest city and the smallest church of all the seven. Isn't that kind of interesting? The longest letter is written to the smallest, most insignificant when you compare it to Ephesus or Pergamos or Smyrna, these, these great cities with these great churches. And here's Thyatira, the smallest. And you see, biggest isn't always best. That's, that's not what this is saying. Biggest isn't always best. But what this is saying is all churches and this church have problems. I don't know if you're aware of this, but there's no such thing as a perfect church. It, it, we could liken this church as the church in the suburbs. You know, if I just get out of the city, if I just go to the suburbs, well, you know, sometimes in the suburbs where you're removed, there can be some pretty bad things that happen. This church has a problem with a woman. They had this problem because they were tolerating her false teaching. This church lacked discernment. 
the gift of discernment and decisiveness. Nobody wanted to challenge what this woman is teaching or doing, which, by the way, is 100% unbiblical and immoral. And so Jesus writes to this church, but not just this church, every church, because as we go through this letter, you're actually going to find out that this church continues until the end. Why? Because corruption is universal. Corruption is universal. You know, it's kind of like compromise. Compromise is universal. And if it's left unchecked, it grows and grows and grows. And in one form or another, in every church, in every home, in every business, in fact, the larger the institution, the larger scale the corruption is. Now look at our government. <laughs> you can't get any more corrupt than that. I don't care what side of the aisle you sit on. The larger it becomes, the greater it can be. So, so what does Jesus have to say? Look at Revelation chapter 2, verse 18. And to the angel of the church of Thyatira write, These things saith the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire, and his feet like fine brass. I know your works, love, service, faith, and your patience. And as for your works, the last are more than the first. Well, the first thing Jesus does is he introduces himself saying that he is the Son of God, God deity. And this is the only time you see this in these letters where he calls himself the Son of God. You see the Son of Man, but you don't see this. So he's really trying to point something out. He is the only one that has the authority to judge. And when he judges, it's just and you should listen. Jesus is God in the flesh. He's deity. He says that he has eyes like a flame of fire and, and feet like fine brass. And again, this is speaking of judgment. Now, now understand, Thyatira is a commercial city. It's located about 40 miles southeast from Pergamos. I have a map. There I underlined. There's Thyatira. So we, we went from Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergama. Now we're going down. It's almost like a diagonal. What's that? I remember that diagonal game where you do the little chip things. I forget what it's called. What? Connect four. Connect four. Yeah, it's like Connect Four. Oh, he blocked me. But we're in Thyatira, right there. It's a commercial town. It's a working man's town. It, it, it's it's it was built as a military outpost to be literally the first line of defense for Pergamus. So the idea was this, that if an attacking army would come, let them destroy Thyatira. It's not a big deal. It'll give us a chance to build up our defenses to protect ourselves. So they're really like a big lighter of cities, disposable. That's how Pergamus, which is the capital of that area, viewed it. It was known for having a number of guilds. I mean, everything had a guild. If you were a dishwasher, you were in a guild. If you were textiles, if you were fishing, if you were a plumber, it doesn't matter what it was, you were in a guild. I mean, this is literally what we call trade unions, and you had to be in a trade union to work. From potters to metalworking. No union card, no work. The single biggest of the guilds was textiles. It was known for its cloth. Expensive clothes were made there, you know, known for the, the bright red, purple clothing, very expensive. So, so it's kind of like the garment district of Asia Minor. You know, this is where you had couture. That's where they were located. So Coco Chanel was in Thyatira. It was known for its purple dye. The third purple dye was extracted from the throat it was called the murex. It was a, a shellfish, and, and you could get one little drop out of it. And, and listen, it was expensive. A pound of this murex dye would cost three years' wages. Now think about that. I don't know how much you make, but you, just, just for one pound of it, three years' wages. 
And everybody wanted it. Everybody wanted I mean, Rome loved their red and their robes, and they wanted this. Now, now in Acts chapter 16, we're, we're inter- introduced to um, a convert of Paul. In fact, it's his first convert from Europe, a woman by the name of Lydia. In Acts 16, verse 14, we read this. Now, a certain woman named Lydia heard us, and she was the seller of purple from the city of Thyatira. It's the only other time you hear that word. Who worshiped God. And the Lord opened her heart to heed the things spoken by Paul. You know, that's why when you're going to go witness to a family member or a friend, that should be your prayer. Lord, open their heart to receive the things from above. Because only, God, only God can open the heart of people. Only God saves. We don't. Now, we're told that Lydia and her whole house was saved and baptized. She lived in Philippi, but she would go back and forth to Thyatira. She peddled in purple dye and, 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 and linen. So we had a suburban church. She was a big city girl. It was also famous for a temple to fortune-telling. I don't know if you ever watched the late night, you know, call Chloe. This was where she began. And Chloe, actually the chief oracle of this temple, um, it was believed, and this is pure speculation in church history, um, had a significant downfall in what we're going to see going on in this church. These guilds were all attached to false gods and immoral forms of worship. See, basically, the way it would work is if you wanted to work, you had to be part of a guild. If you wanted to be part of a guild, you had to go to the temple and worship. So what you would do is you would go to the temple and worship, and they would sacrifice animals to that deity, that idol, and barbecue it right in front of you. And then you'd start drinking. And then you would have a drunken orgy going on. And if you didn't want to partake in that, you weren't a part of the guild, which means you weren't working. And so it brings up this question of faith and compromising your faith so that you can put food on the table. Well, God understands. God knows. God knows that I love him, but I have to do this. Well, is he God or isn't he God? That's kind of the question. Is he the God in theory? Or is he the living God? Jesus says, look again at verse 1, These things saith the Son of God, deity, who has the eyes like a flame of fire and feet like fine brass. Right off the bat, compared to all the other letters, Jesus is firmer, more severe, you know, growing up, and if your parents were like mine, I come from old school parents. Um, they love me. I know they love me. They love me when they would spank me. They love me when they would put me on timeouts for years at a time, and I deserved it. You know, not every kid burns down the neighbor's garage and does stuff like that. But I knew when I was in trouble. Because, see, my parents always call me David. David, David, come, oh, come here, David. But the minute I heard, David Michael Evans, I was in trouble. And I knew it was going to be severe. I knew. Jesus is writing, he's warning that he's coming to judge. He's coming to judge. And, and literally, he's going to speak a little bit to the church, but he's really speaking to the believers. He's not speaking to the institution. He's speaking to the believers in this. And what you're going to see is there's really no prescription for the problem. The description that Jesus uses from chapter 1 is that of complete and total judgment. Eyes like a flame of fire. It's, it speaks of not only seeing through all things, Not only seeing everything, 
But it's literally that kind of look that kind of causes you to burn up. You know what I mean? Flames. Everything we do is going to be put into the flames. And whatever's left over, that's your reward. Feet like fine brass. Brass or, or copper in the Bible speaks solely of judgment. And even though this letter is very firm, it's very stern, the relationship, the love is still there. See, what we have getting away from is we think love is just tolerating. Oh, I just, we're just going to tolerate each other. You know, they have their quirks and this is okay. And, and you know, we have liberty. That's not love. That's not love. Love educates. Love teaches. And, and, and that's, that's what he's doing. He's trying to educate them. He, he's trying to, to warn them. And, and, and so he's wanting to correct them. And that's why we read in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 5, Do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens, and scourges every son whom he receives. Now that doesn't mean you go around and you sniff out sin and, and you and you I'm the chastening hand of the Lord. No, no. Paul is very clear. If you see a brother in a fault, look in the mirror first. And then with love and gentleness, go to them. Not pointing fingers, but in love, trying to lift them out of whatever they're in. And we like to do this. My grandmother liked to do this. And she was really quick because she went from this to the thumper. Boom. Boom. It's like, oh, I still have knots. One day, every one of us will stand before the Lord face to face. And this is kind of the question. You will stand before the Lord and you will see one of two looks. Either it's going to be the look of love and acceptance, or you're going to look into eyes that are as a flame of fire. And that's not the one you want. Ooh. Anyways, look at verse 19. I know your works, your love, your service, faith, and your patience. And as far as your works, the last are more than the first. So the first thing Jesus does is he tells them what I like about you. Remember that old romantic songs? What I like about you. This is what he says, hey, I like this about you. I like this. He, he tells them, I, I know, I know completely with complete and absolute understanding and authority all of your works. And again, that word is, it works or is where we get our word energy from. So the idea is energetic activity. I don't know if you had kids. Sometimes you'd ask them to do something. Okay, I'll do it. And you're like going, really? Versus the kid. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I, I wanted to clean my room. I'll get on it right now, Mom. Yeah. Yeah, what world, world do we live in, right? Uh, I'm just going to sleep in the bed later today. <laughs> but these guys had energetic activities. They loved serving the Lord. Their love there, it's agape love, unconditional love. So their works were, were flavored with the right motives. Some people have energetic you know, activities, but their motive is me, myself, and I. Look at me, everybody, look at me. Yay, look what I'm doing. These guys had the right motives. They had energetic activity. He loves their service. That word service there is where we get the word deacon from. And there are deaconesses. And a deacon is someone who voluntarily, spontaneously, continuously shows the love of Christ by putting the needs of others above their own. Think about that for a second. If you are a person who loves the Lord and you voluntarily, spontaneously, continually show the love of Christ by putting the needs of others ahead of yours, You're a deacon. You don't need someone to put a name badge on you. You just are. You're anointed of the Lord. 
Now, one of the most glaring attributes of the world, the church, Christians today, Paul writes about it in Timothy's, the letters to Timothy. One of the biggest problems is me, myself, and I mentality. Me, myself, and I. See, we live in a self-absorbed society. No one willing to sacrifice anything. Well, as long as it's convenient, maybe. People that will make commitments and never follow through. These Christians are energetic. They unconditionally lay down their lives daily. They put the needs of others before their own, which is truly walking in the footsteps of Jesus Christ. That's what walking in the footsteps of Jesus is. Sacrificing. It costs you something. But you do it because of the love of God that's in you. Jesus loves their faith. That word faith there, you can circle it right above it because it's a better translation. Faithfulness. If they said it, they did it. They were faithful. Completely faithful. They spared nothing. If they signed up to do children's church, they were there to do children's church. And they showed up with a great attitude. A great attitude. Did you see that word, Jesus? I mean, I almost want to cross that out of my Bible because I'm not a big patience person. That's one of my, you know, big sins in my life. I just don't like patience. I want it now. And I want it yesterday. Can I get an amen? Is anybody like that? Yeah. You know, patience to me is I waited three seconds. It's not done yet. But Jesus loves their patience. But understand, the idea of biblical patience isn't necessarily waiting. The idea of patience is to hold up or to endure under difficult circumstances. In other words, they didn't take the easy way out. They didn't just quit. They endured. This is hard. I'm under attack. It's easy to just quit and then get relief. Oh, yeah. Whew. Christians, Christ never quit on us. We shouldn't quit on each other. We really shouldn't quit on each other. It's easy to just quit, throw in the towel, I'm done. We should pray for this kind of patience. And here's the kicker. Of all of these things, Jesus said the last are more than the first. The more faithful they were, the more opportunities they had to use those attributes and they continue to grow and grow and grow. Remember Jesus says, if you are faithful in the little things, I will make you ruler over many. We want to be ruler over many without the little things. We'll hire people to deal with the little things. Jesus says, no, that's not how it's going to work in the kingdom. Look at verse 20. He says, nevertheless, I have a few things against you because you allow that woman Jezebel, this is where you have to go, dun, dun, dun. Because you allowed that woman Jezebel, dun, 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 who called herself a prophetess to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual morality and eat things sacrificed to idols. And I gave her time to repent of her sexual morality, and she did not repent. Indeed, I will cast her into a sickbed, and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation, unless they repent of their deeds. I will kill her children with death. Now, I just want to throw this in here so you guys don't check out. These are her offspring, not the Lord's. Okay, so if you're born again, this does not apply to you. These are the offspring of Jezebel. And all the churches shall know. Now, now let's back up again because you, you, let's, let's look at it. And all the churches, that includes us, shall know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts. And I will give to each one of you according to your works. Hmm. 
So how could this church or any church do such great things and be in such hot water? Plain and simple. Doctrine and a lack of discernment. And no one had any guts to stand up and say no. Yeah, sure, they carried a Bible. They maybe even read it once in a while. Oh, yeah, I read it every so often. Yeah, they may pray, yeah, you know, bless the pizza. Bless my wife's cooking. You know what happened last time? But listen, you could read the Bible every day. If you're not applying it to your life, if you're not living it, it's nothing but ink and paper. It's nothing but ink and paper. They heard the words. They knew the words. They weren't doers of the word. Notice, notice in verse 20, he says, you allow. You allowed it. He's not saying I allowed it. He said, no, you allowed this in your house. You allowed this in your life. You did this. And isn't when we allow things in our life, the first thing we do when things going south is blame God? How can you allow this? And he's like, well, wait a minute. Time out. I told you on this page, don't do that. How is it my fault? Now, do you want to get out of it? Listen to me. You want to stay in it? Stay in it. I'm not going to make you do anything. They allowed the teaching that was contrary to the Word of God. They allowed it to be introduced in the church. They tolerated it. They said nothing about it. They knew it was wrong. They've known it was wrong, but they tolerated this woman to stand up and to teach moral leniency, what we might call greasy grace, when the Bible clearly says something different. Most believe that this woman Jezebel, it's not her real name. I mean, it, it, it's, it's kind of like Judas. I don't know if you've met one lately, but, you know, after, after Judas in the Bible, it kind of ruined that name, scratch it off the list. I don't know anybody who's naming anybody Jezebel. So they, they're basically saying that this is a nickname because of the things she did. It reminded them of Jezebel of the Old Testament. Some believe that her name was Sambathe, who was the chief oracle of the fortune teller temple. We don't know. Some believe that, and, and church history says she had some form of conversion experience, and because she was notable, they allowed her to stand up and teach. Oh, she received Jesus. Give a testimony. Stand up. I don't know if you've seen this, and, and but like on TBN and some of these other channels, when somebody famous supposedly gives their life to the Lord, they immediately put a microphone in front of them and they stand on their show going, oh, Jesus did this. And the next thing you know, you hear in the news, oh, this was Orlando, uh, uh, Evander Holofield. Do you guys remember when he came to the Lord? And the next thing you know, he found out he had 31 kids out of wedlock. 18 of them after he received Jesus. And they're putting a microphone saying, Praise the Lord. Send us your money so the good work can continue. Hallelujah. I'm like, oh, really? Then it was Deion Sanders, and then it's this guy, and then it's this guy. Well, now it's Miley Cyrus. I've given my life back to the Lord. Really? Don't say anything. Let us see it. Let us see it. You can say it all you want. doesn't make it true. See, saying you're a Christian, coming to church, make not a Christian of you. I'm channeling Yoda right now, okay? That would be like you sleeping in the garage and calling yourself a car. <laughs> or going to the donut shop and buying a donut and saying, Pull it over, mister. I'm giving you a ticket. Does not make you a cop. Go into the donut shop. Saying you're a Christian 
doesn't make it true. She calls herself a prophetess. She's self-proclaimed. Jesus didn't call her a prophetess, did he? And the church leaders didn't check it out. They, they didn't put her through, you know, the tests to prove she was who she said she was. Tests? What do you mean tests? We, we have tests? Oh, yeah, you guys are all taking tests right after the service. It'll, I'm thinking about 10, 15 minutes will be done, and then you'll be done with your tests in about eight hours. <laughs> no, there, there's tests. There's tests to prove that you can put yourself up against the Word of God so that you can say, I am who He says I am. Not I am who I claim I am. It doesn't matter what this book says. See, one of the tests is the character tests. Character tests. You know, it doesn't really matter what you say. How do you live outside of church? Everybody comes into church going, hallelujah, praise the Lord. I've yet to see one person stumbling to church, smoking a joint and a bottle of Jack Daniels going, oh, man. You know what I mean? How do you live outside of church? If your life outside of church does not mimic who you portray in church, that's called a hypocrite. And you need to check yourself. And I say this because I love you. The Lord's coming soon. Time is short. And, and, and if you want to be a Christian, you can become a Christian. But you have to lay down your life and take up His. I mean, think about it. One day, you know, there they are. They're, they have to be a part of these guilds. And someone at the church runs into this oracle and they tell her about Jesus and and then she shows up at church and she says hey I'm a Christian I gave my heart to Jesus and God has called me as a prophet to the church and listen a lot of churches are hungry for that kind of stuff we want a prophet we want a prophetess give us a prophetess yes 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 we'll build our numbers we'll build a kingdom and the leadership or the Christians didn't check it out. Did she renounce that fortune telling stuff? Did she give up her position as the chief oracle in that temple? Is she embracing the biblical teachings as taught from Genesis to Revelation? Well, they didn't have Revelation yet. They had everything else at this point. Is she embracing that stuff? What kind of fruit is she exhibiting in her life? This woman, again, just like the Jezebel of old, her father was the king of Sidon, but he was also the chief priest in the temple of Baal in Sidon. So he was both king and priest. And he marries his daughter off. I wonder why. This is one of those things where I'll pay you to take her to King Ahab. King Ahab is considerably the worst of all the kings in the northern territory of Israel. She is one evil lady, and she comes in and she rules the roost. Ahab has no spine whatsoever. She introduces Baal worship and Ashtoreth worship. She demands a temple be built to Baal. She orders Ahab to begin to systematically murder all the prophets of Yahweh. And she didn't abolish the Hebrew religion. No, no, no. What she said is, we'll just combine them. It's called synchronicity, where you start combining Christianity with the new age and, and this and that. So, you, so you, go, you go into a church and you're looking for a church and you want to make sure they got cool programs. You go, oh, look, they got Christian yoga. Yes, we're there. Uh, yoga can never be Christian. It is a doctrine of demons. The positioning itself is channeling of evil spirits. But it makes me feel so much better. Oh. 
Spend more time with Jesus, you'll feel better. They mix the false with the true. And they caused Israel to fall into idolatry. And this is the same thing this woman in Thyatira did. The same thing that she did is going on in churches all across the world right now. Same exact same thing. What was she doing? She's teaching and seducing Christians to fall into sexual morality and to eat things sacrificed to idols. Well, how is that possible? Again, remember these guilds, if you wanted to work, you had to go to the temple services, the feasts. You sacrifice to, the, to that idol, you barbecue it, you eat it, you get drunk, and the next thing you know, you're doing things you wouldn't normally do. And if you didn't show up, you didn't have a job. And this, this woman, here's, here's, the, here's the tagline that you'll hear. And, it's, and a lot of times, guys, you're the ones who are saying it. So gals, listen. God knows your heart. He knows our heart. He understands. He really does. He, he, he knows what you do in the flesh won't be judged in the spirit. We have liberty. We're, we're married in God's eyes. No, you're not. Fornication is fornication. Adultery is adultery. And Jesus takes it a step further. He says, if you look on another woman, pornography, and lust after her, you have committed adultery. Not against your wife, but also against your Lord. Aren't you glad you came this morning? And all over, all over this valley, you have Christian pastors that are mixing pagan worship with their Christianity because they're more concerned about the bottom line than where they're sending people in eternity. And it's wrong, and it needs to be spoken out against. John wrote 2,000 years ago. Listen to what John wrote in 1 John chapter 4, verse 1. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are God. Because many false prophets have gone into the world. Now, and this is John's time. Many, what do you think has happened in the last 2,000 years? Do you think there's less or there's more? There's a lot more. There's a lot more. They've multiplied exponentially. If there were many then, then there's legions now. You know what I mean? And that's why we need to know the Word of God. This is why we need to pray and exercise the gift of discernment. And, and again, just because someone carries a Bible, just because they're on TV or on the radio, doesn't mean they're from God. You understand this, this time in church history. This, is, this, this church began around 600 A.D., and, and, and the period, if you're a dispensationalist, ends 1500. It's kind of the dark ages. You know what I mean? But the way Jesus reads this is it's continuing on today. If you, when you read, really read this, it began in 600 and it's not going to end until he returns. Around 600, in fact, to be exact, 601 is when Muhammad began to get his visions and prophecies from Allah, and we know that Allah is the moon god. He's a pagan god. So this is now going to be competing. This is going to be factions warring because they believe they're right, and what they have cannot stand up to the Bible, so you just got to kill all the Bible believers. Okay? Today, you have guys that are riding on bicycles. they got the cute hats, white shirts, name tags. All smiles. Can I tell you about Jesus Christ? Yeah, can I tell you you got the wrong Jesus? 
See, just because they're all smiles and they're knocking on the door doesn't mean they're from God. You need to judge and discern based on what they believe and what they do. Listen to what Jesus says in John 7, 24. Do not judge according to appearance, but judge righteous judgment. Jesus warns in Matthew 7, verse 15, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. So, so a false teacher or a wolf will knock on your door or look into the camera Praise the Lord, hallelujah. And they're dressed like a sheep going by <laughs> until they eat you and devour you. I mean, never once is somebody going to knock on your door. Hi, I'm David. I'm here to deceive you and rip you off. Can I come in? They don't do that. Never once is that guy on TV going to go, in the name of Lucifer, I'm here to steal and kill and destroy your life. Send your check to David Evan Ministries, P.O. Box Canada. You're, they're not going to do that. They're not going to do that. They're going to tell you how much God loves them to love you through them. So how can you know if it's true? Again, number one, character character. A Christian may talk like a Christian in church, but if they're talking like a sailor and living like a sailor the other 166 hours, mm, I might question who they really are. Character counts. Character gives credence to the words that they speak. Jezebel was loose, morally in every other way. Number two, doctrine. What do they teach? Does it line up scripturally with what the Bible says concerning who Jesus is? Who is Jesus? Is it, do they say he is God, creator of all things, who came in flesh, who died, was resurrected, and is right now seated in the heavenlies waiting to come for his bride? Is he God? What about his works? Did he do these miracles? It, it, you know, what do they believe concerning Jesus? Does it line up scripturally? Paul, writing to the Galatians in Galatians chapter 1, verse 6, says this, he's, and he's writing to the church, I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another, but there are some of who trouble you and, and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven, Moroni, <coughs> Moroni, <coughs> preach any other gospel to you than that which you have been preached to, which we have preached to you, let him be accursed. If it doesn't line up scripturally, there is no new divine revelation. Amen. Amen. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1. God, who at various times and device ways spoke to the fathers through the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us, period, through His Son. Not through Mohammed and not through Joseph Smith, not through Confucius, not through Buddha or any of these others. He is speaking to us through His Son. Number three, fruit. What fruit is blossoming from their lifestyle? Here, Jezebel's fruit was causing others to fall into sexual morality. And it spread like cancer, causing the church to slip into what is called the dark ages. This is where you start getting the name Mother Church from. This is where you're introduced to things like purgatory and indulgences and all those things. And it's not scriptural. Next, Jesus turns from speaking to Jezebel to the church. Look at verse 21. 
And I gave her time to repent of her sexual morality, and she did not repent. So Jesus is speaking to the church, saying, listen, I gave her a chance. I, I've given her a, a, a million and one chances, and she's not going to turn. She refused. And, and listen, here's the reality is God, Jesus, wants to bless. He hates to judge. God wants to bless. He hates to judge. He loves to forgive. God desires that none should perish, that all should repent. That's the Lord's heart. He gave her time and she refused. That's not, she, didn't want to, she, didn't want to, she didn't want to turn. She liked her lifestyle. Look at verse 22. Indeed, I will cast her into a sickbed and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation. Now, I don't believe this is the great tribulation because there's no direct article there. When it's speaking of the great tribulation, it's always the great tribulation. Here it's simply, I will cast those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation unless they repent of their deeds. I will kill her children with death. These are Jezebel's offspring, not the Lord's. And all the churches shall know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts. And I will give to each one of you according to your works. Now, the first thing I have to say is, and, and, and listen, because you, you, you get beat up on the, tel, on, the, on the TV with people like this. Not every sickness is a result of you being in sin. Every sickness is a result of sin, and it happened in the garden. When Adam sinned, death and sickness came in, and it goes through our veins. Not every time you're sick, you're in what we would call sin, and you need to repent. You hear that on the TV all the time. Forget it. That's not true. Sickness is a result of living in a fallen world. Sickness is a result of just getting older. And listen, I'm like you, I hate it. I'm like, oh, I'm getting older. It's like I'm the only person I know who cannot eat for a week and still gain 10 pounds. I'm going, what is up? <laughs> Paul, the apostle, went through horrible physical sickness. And there are a lot of wonderful saints serving the Lord, just like Paul, through sickness. However, there are sicknesses that are a result of lifestyle. People who for a moment of pleasure find their whole world ruined and themselves in a sickbed of depression. I don't know about you, but you know, Depression is just as much a sickbed as anything else. Loneliness, STDs, AIDS, cancer, there's a thousand things. But, you know, sometimes because of a choice we make, and yeah, it might have been fun at the moment, you live with it for the rest of your life. And to me, there is no greater tribulation than that. But there's forgiveness in the Lord. There's redemption in the Lord. The blood covers your sin. Love covers a multitude of sin, the Scripture tells us. I don't believe that this is speaking of the great tribulation. I believe it's speaking of persecution and, and other forms from governments, maybe Rome, Islam, the church itself. Because let's face it, in a moment of weakness, and, and you know, I, I, I would say, if you've never had a moment of weakness, raise your hand, because I want to trade positions with you. We've all had moments of weakness. We've all done things that we thought things, said things that we wish we wouldn't have. And, 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 you know, in a moment of weakness, when you need the love of the church, that's where the tribulation comes from the first and most hardest. It's from the church. 
Brothers who say, I love you one minute, but the minute you don't live up to their expectation, forget it. And it's wrong. Man, we're in this together. We can't do it alone. You know, when it comes to sex and things like that, God created it. He created it for human beings to enjoy it. God sanctified it. He ordained it as a blessing in the confines of the marital bed. Hebrews 13, 4, one of my favorite verses, because I'm married. Marriage is honorable among all, and the bed is undefiled. But fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. Now, that doesn't mean you can't be forgiven, but you got to get your life on track. Live the way God called you to live. Well, but pastor, you don't understand. This is a new day. It's a modern day. God knows my art. Yeah, he does. And he knows that you are just like they were. And he calls you to purity, to holiness. He says, be holy as I am holy. Well, you don't understand. That other church doesn't care. Well, that's fine. That other church is teaching the doctrines of Jezebel. I'm going to tell you the truth that God has so much more for you than what you think you need physically. Because if you have that great a need physically, you are starved spiritually. And the Lord needs to come in and fill that void in your life. Well, yeah, but He knows my heart. Well, exactly. And let me tell you what God knows about your heart. Jeremiah 17, 9. The heart is deceitful above all things. Okay, just so we know, above all things means everything, okay? And desperately wicked. Who can know it? God does, because he says, I, the Lord, search the heart and test the mind to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruits of his doing. And if a Christian is living in any immoral way that hasn't been taken to the woodshed yet, God's giving you time to repent before he gets out the whooping stick. So all I can say is, before you leave here, lay it down. Because when he gets his switch out, it's going to hurt. Now, are those that hold that, you know, Jesus is speaking about this great tribu- tribulation in a prophetic sense? Again, I don't. Um, but this is why Jesus tells you, me, we, the church, in verse 25, look what he says. Hold fast what you have till I come. Now, 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 everyone else in the church, what he's taught, he's not, he's not talking to those that are in this sin. He's saying, everyone else of you, hold fast to what you have till I come. And then in verse 24, now to you I say to the rest in Tyra, Tyra, as many as do not have this doctrine, who have not known the depths of Satan, As they say, I will put on you no other burden. Every cult beginning with the Gnostics, the Judaizers, and continuing with all the cults today, and and just so you understand, there's over 100,000 religions today um, in one form or another. There's actually a church to Kurt Cobain. I don't know if you knew that. You can go to the church of Kurt Cobain. There's a church that's dedicated to Tori Amos and her teachings. You could go to that too. Everyone claim that they and they alone have the deeper things of God. Oh, yeah, you go to that church, they go through the Bible, but that's the simple stuff. If you really want to know the deep things of God, you should come to our home study. And Jesus says, that ain't deep. That's the depths of Satan. That's where they're going to take you, to the depths of Satan. And that's going to put you back in bondage. That's what Jesus is saying, not me. You want to go back into bondage? Okay, go to that home study. Go for that deeper thing. But you're going right back into bondage. Jesus clearly saying here, follow the word of God where you are free and there are no burdens and no strings attached. You know, it's like Pinocchio. I got no strings on me. That's Christ. All these other cults, they put strings on you. And and that's why he says in verse 25, but hold fast. Notice he doesn't say hold on loosely. Just hold on loosely. 
He says, no, hold fast. And literally the idea here is put a death grip on Jesus and the word of God. You put a death grip on that in your heart. You don't let go of it for nothing. If anybody tries to persuade you or sway you, you go, get behind me, Satan. Well, that's the one loving. That's not tolerant. doesn't matter. Listen, your life is at stake. That's, I mean, I'm holding on to what I got. This is what he gave me. In verse 26, he goes on, And he who overcomes and keeps my works until the end, to him I will give power over the nations. He shall rule them with a rod of iron. They shall be dashed into pieces like a potter's vessel, as I also have received from my Father, and I will give to him the morning star. He who has an ear. I think, does everybody have two ears here? Everybody have two ears? Okay, so he who has two ears. Oh, I just added to the word. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. Jesus is quoting Psalm 2 here. This is the promise of authority for all believers to rule and reign with Jesus Christ during the millennium. And we'll get to that as we move through the book of Revelation. But what Jesus is saying is regardless of what anyone else says or tries to convince you of, you stick to me like glue. And if you stick to me like glue, you will overcome all this crazy stuff that you see going on around you. And you will rule and reign with me for a thousand years. But 1 John chapter 5, verse 4. Whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world. Our faith. Who is he who overcomes the world? But he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus in John 16, These things I have spoken to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. But be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Only those who overcome, only those who overcome all the lies and the deceptions of the flesh in this world will rule and reign with Jesus. And you have his promise on it. And not only do you have the promise of ruling and reigning, do you see what he says in verse 28? And I will give him the morning star. What exactly does that mean? Well, the answer is found in Revelation 22, verse 16. Jesus says this, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things in the churches. That's us. We're in the church, right? I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright and morning star. So when Jesus promises he will give us the morning star. What it is, is it's a promise of a truer and greater revelation of who he is. That as we stick to him, as we adhere and hold fast to the word of God, he will reveal his true self more and more to us. It's a promise of a greater presence, protection, and provision in the life of a believer. Those others who are following Jezebel, they're going to be cast into that sick bed. But Jesus says, I'm going to come to you. I'm going to come to you. Those others, they're going to be cast into tribulation. But Jesus says, I'm going to come to you. I'm going to come to you. You're going to overcome that. All we have to do is stay glued to Jesus Christ. And he says, I will come for you. Amen? Amen? Well, Father in heaven, we rejoice and thank you that as we stick to you, doesn't matter what goes on around us, not only will you be with us, not only do you live in us, but Lord, we have your promise that you will come for us. So Lord, just pour out your spirit in a beautiful, beautiful, wonderful way. Lord, I, I pray, Lord, as you have just been with pinpoint precision, I mean, smart bomb, laser precision, speaking to our hearts, that we would truly lay down these things that are so easily 
grabbing hold of our hearts. We want to walk with you. We want to know you in a, in a deeper way. And Lord, we want to be stuck to glue to you. So Lord, continue to reveal the lies and the deception. And, and just real quickly, I, I know I'm over, but I just feel compelled to do this. If you have been convinced through the teachings of the world and other things that living as the world lives and being a Christian is okay, I'm here to tell you it's not. And you're only deceiving yourself. But you know what? You can lay that down and you can get right with Jesus Christ right now. And for some, it'll actually mean becoming born again. For others, it, it's going to be making a rededication. But if you want to do that, if you truly want to walk with Jesus, right where you are, raise your hand and you say, that's me. I've been convinced of a lie. I've been believing it. God bless you right here. Anyone else? God bless you in the back. God bless you right here. Anyone else? You feel like you've been convinced of the lie? Well, the Lord is here with the truth, and the truth will set you free. Anyone else? Real quickly. Oh, Father, you see those hands, you see those hearts, and we thank you, Lord, for the work that you do in our presence. So bless now. Lord, as far as east is from west, those that raise their hand, see their sin no more. Set them free. Put their feet on that solid foundation. And Lord, take their hands and walk with them now. Bless, pour out your spirit, we pray, in Jesus' name and for his sake. And if you agree with that church, you will say, Amen. Amen.